Good morning. I'm Megan Gunner. I'm a Regents professor. I'm the director or chair of the Institute of Child Development, and I'm the associate director uh, for the Center for Neurobehavioral Development here at the university. I'm delighted to introduce Professor Jeremy Wolf. Uh, professor Wolf is a professor of ophthalmology and radiology at the Harvard School of Medicine and the director of the Visual Attention Lab at Brigham and Women's Hospital. His research focuses on visual search and visual attention with particular interest in socially important search tasks such as medical image perception, like are you really able to identify that cancer, um, security, such as baggage screening, and intelligence, with no example given for that one. <laughs> well, Professor Wolf's guided search model is one of the leading theoretical approaches to the study of visual search. He has published over 190 research peer-reviewed articles in leading journals. He is the editor of the journal Cognitive Research, Principles and Implications, and he is the immediate past editor of the journal Attention, Perception, and Psychophysics. He is the former president of the Federation for the Association of Behavioral and Brain Sciences, FABS, which was very important in really trying to discuss the reasonableness of the change in the clinical trials definition. He's on the governing board of Vision Sciences and is the fellow of a, uh, the American, uh, AAAS, excuse me, the American Psychological Association and the Association for Psychological Sciences and a member of the Society of Experimental Psycho, uh, Psychologists. Professor Wolf received his undergraduate degree from Princeton and his PhD from MIT, both in psychology. Uh, he has no relevant disclosures. He'll speak again for about 40 minutes and then we'll have a Q&A. Please um, join me in welcoming Professor Wolf. So thank you very much. Um, this has been fascinating so far, and if with a little luck, it'll remain reasonably interesting for the next 40 minutes. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, as it says here, is the uh, changes in the definition of the NIH definition of clinical trials and the implications of that for uh, those of us doing basic behavioral um, and uh, social research. Um, let me tell you uh, briefly what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to basically describe the journey that um, NIH and our community have been on over the course of uh, the last couple of years, I would say. Um, I will argue that we have a common destination in which uh, all federally funded research on humans is uh, reliably registered and reported in some fashion. Um, and I will say that we're not quite there yet, uh, that there are still issues that, uh, that, need to be, that need to be worked out. So I don't have any relevant disclosures, but I'll make a couple of disclosures in any case. Um, so these are the, associate, the, the organizations for which I am not speaking. Um, so I was the president of, the, um, of, of FABS. Um, but I'm not giving an official FABS vantage point on this, and I'm the editor of a journal and, and on the board. Um, I'm speaking uh, for myself based on the work of lots of other people. Um, oh, and, and one more disclosure that's actually important, particularly given the last two wonderful talks. I am not a policy person. That is not my day job. I am a uh, basic uh, cognitive visual attention researcher who happens to have been in a couple of institutional positions that caused the clinical trial issue to be highly relevant uh, to me in my work as, as, as for instance, the, uh, the, the president of, uh, of FABS. Um, I, I, I think that was supposed to look like um, the, uh, the, the emails that you get on a regular basis from the NIH telling you about new policies. Um, <laughs> And, and that's, that's me attempting to digest it. Um, so uh, where, where, do, where does this all start? Um, NIH was faced with a uh, problem. The problem was that not enough of their uh, clinical trials research was getting reported out in a reasonable amount of time 
Um, and uh, uh, that was failing the responsibilities of the scientific community to tell the world what they were doing with, uh, with the money that NIH was uh, giving them. So uh, fewer than half the trials funded by NIH are published in a peer-reviewed biomedical journal within 30 months of the, uh, the, the completion of, of the trial. And that was um, deemed to be unacceptable. Um, okay, so what's a clinical trial? A big piece of what I'm going to tell you about has to do with the distinction between uh, regulations and, and sort of what, what the person on the street or the random researcher thinks of as a, um, uh, as a clinical trial. So colloquially, we kind of understand this. You, know, you, you, you do some research on a mouse, um, maybe several mice, and you find a promising molecule, and then you're going to try this out on some humans. And once you try it out on, uh, on, on some humans, uh, that, that, that's clinical trial. And you progress through the whole clinical trial process up to uh, the FDA. What, the, um, what NIH's definition of a clinical trial says is that it's a research study in which one or more human subjects are prospectively assigned to one or more interventions to evaluate uh, the effects of those interventions on health-related uh, biomedical or behavioral, uh, behavioral outcomes. Um, so the change in, uh, or the, the, the policy on clinical trials started being formulated in like two, uh, 2014. I, uh, 2012. I should, <laughs> I should say that one of the little surprises um, when I got invited to uh, give, give this talk was the discovery that Carrie Wolinitz was going to uh, be here, and she knows a great deal more about this particular policy than I do. I'm the user, she's the author. Um, so we, 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 can, we can get into that in the question period later, but I will try not to be too factually inaccurate. So it's been several years, but um, the behavioral science community really didn't um, uh, pay that much attention um, because we didn't think we were doing anything that would be described as a clinical trial in the sort of colloquial sense of the term. And, and the, the statements that came out about, uh, um, about the, 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 the revision of the policy included lines like, this is not intended to expand the category of clinical trials. Um, so that was fine, and I would be interested, actually, in, in, in Carrie's take later on whether this is an accurate assessment of what goes on next. Um, NIH has a very strong interest in making sure that all clinical trials get swept into this new reporting, registrating and reporting process, so that all of that stuff gets into, um, at least into the clinical trials database, and you can, uh, you can access it in some variety. Um, and the, oh, oh, is that a, oh, there we go. Um, the problem was that um, th th there, there are edge cases that are sort of wandering off the reg reservation that um, aren't getting captured. And I think they were concerned about this. We weren't, we weren't part of that discussion particularly because we're off here operating in, in the world of, you know, blissful ignorance about all of this. And um, the, the critical moment for us, and, the, and, and really the entire reason that, um, that I ended up as a, uh, a, a point person for this, is that I happened to, uh, happened to be sitting on the National Academy's Board on Behavioral Cognitive and Sensory Sciences um, when uh, Bill Riley um, from OBSSR at NIH came to us and said, you guys really need to pay attention to this because you don't know it, but your research is going to be defined as a clinical trial. And if your research is defined as a clinical trial, th there, th the community is going to need to respond. You're going to be needing to fill out new forms that you don't know about. Um, and uh, I'm sitting at that committee meeting. Um, well, and, and what he's telling us is that, 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 that it's going to get defined more broadly than we were thinking. And, the, and, and really, the critical issue 
um, comes to the, uh, uh, how you talk about the word intervention, one of the critical issues. Um, if you go, uh, if you apply for a, uh, an NIH grant at this point, um, and you're using humans, uh, you're going to end up with uh, the four questions that critically define whether you are doing a clinical trial. Um, does it involve human participants? Sure. Um, are they prospectively assigned uh, to an, an intervention, in many cases, uh, of basic behavioral research? Probably. Um, is it going to, is the study designed to evaluate the effect of an intervention on the participants? Well, at some level, of course, right? You're doing an experiment because you're doing something to them, and you want to see what happens. And if you take intervention in that sense, then the answer to that is yes. And the final question is um, whether or not the effect that you're measuring uh, is a health-related uh, biomedical or behavioral outcome you're applying to the NIH. Do you want to check the box, do you do want to uncheck the box that says that you're doing something that's related to health? Um, so the answer to that is probably yes. And at that point, it's pretty clear that large swaths of basic behavioral research are going to be uh, uh, counted as, um, as clinical trials. So I'm sitting there at this committee meeting with uh, Nancy Canwisher, my colleague from MIT, and and, and, and we're getting agitated uh, about this because this is starting to sound um, like blissful ignorance might not have actually been the right approach. Um, and of course, we're sitting on the, uh, um, uh, on, on the internet and across that we, we, we're sending emails back and forth to each other across the same room, 22,000 miles into space and back. Um, and um, by the end of that meeting, um, at Nancy's suggestion, we'd fired up a, um, a petition, one of these online petitions. Uh, I can't quite remember exactly what it said, but it sort of said, uh, we're not sure we're doing clinical trials. And um, we got, we, we thought we are going to get a few dozen signatures. We got 3,000 signatures. Uh, we thought that was totally cool. Other people told us, you know, online petitions that, you know, for saving puppies and stuff like that. You know, I get 100,000 overnight. But, but we, were, we were still uh, pretty impressed with our, our 3,000 um, signatures on this petition. Why were we concerned? Um, as once the community heard about this, um, a whole string of problems presented themselves to us if we were going to be uh, understood as clinical trials particularly if, if, if it was in the sort of colloquial sense that we normally think about it. Um, the, uh, the FOAs for postdoc proposals said clinical trials not allowed. Oh my god, does that mean we can never have postdocs um, again? Um, clinical trials had to go to study sections that uh, were competent to judge clinical trials. Um, that's not where our studies typically go. Oh my god, am I ever going to get a reasonable grant review? Um, uh, again. Um, pilot data. We do uh, experiments that would check off all four of those boxes on, uh, on, on like three subjects to see if it's going to work or something like that. Am I going to need to register and report that? Um, and, 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 and am I going to have to do this under FDA, FDA rules? And if I, if, I, if, I, if I change my protocol after I've registered it, which of course I do because the, the pilot experiment didn't work, um, is, is the FDA going to throw me into FDA jail um, or whatever? You know, we don't know anything about this. We just heard that the FDA does really impressive things. Um, and um, oh, what, what, a, a, a less bureaucratic issue. If we've got to post um, a, the pre-register our, our exploratory kind of research, and I'm running a little lab not hugely funded, and I put this up, my brilliant idea up there, um, is, is somebody at Great Big Monster Lab at the University of Minnesota going to read that and do my study first and beat me to it? Um, so the, the, the long string of concerns, um, we, we fired up a, a, a more of concerns by, by publishing um, sort of op-ed-ish pieces here, one in, in Nature 
uh, human behavior. And we got into a, a, a dialogue with NIH about this. Initially, that dialogue was not actually um, desperately rewarding. It sort of had this characteristic of us saying, we don't do clinical trials, uh, end of sentence. And, and the, the reaction we were getting back was sort of a, a restatement of the original um, uh, a problem that we had an obligation to human subjects and an obligation to report, which we totally agree with, right? We, we, we didn't disagree about that, but we were talking like this um, back and forth. Um, at this point, uh, there are really, there, there, we, the, uh, the sort of behavioral science community, really pursued a sort of a two-track um, uh, approach to what we now saw as a, as a significant problem. Um, prob the, the piece that I've been most involved with, you could describe as fixing as much um, as we can fix. I gave you that long bulleted list um, uh, of, of some of the problems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, down the bottom. There's more. Um, and uh, I spent a, a, a fair amount of time uh, talking to um, Mike Lauer at NIH sort of working through that bullet list. And I'm very grateful to Lauer for the, the, the time he gave us um, on this, even though I don't think he necessarily um, always agreed with the problems that, that we saw. But in the end, that led to um, what, what boiled down to a sort of a question and answer thing that we published that um, I'm the author because he wasn't allowed to be an author. He should have been. But um, that, that really addressed some of the very specific uh, issues. And, and one way of thinking about why this was a problem, and, part of, and, and was very much part of my conversation with Lauer, um, is uh, in a, it, we typically do relatively small study. You think of a clinical trial, you think of, you know, I'm going to enroll a bazillion patients, they're going to study them for years. Um, we think of an experiment on Monday, we run it, uh, you know, 12, 15 subjects during the course of a week, and that's it. Um, my, a typical grant proposal that I would write would uh, include 20 or more clinical trials, and that's only the ones that I write down in, in, in the grant proposal. And I got the impression, talking to Mike Lauer, um, that that, that, that this was sort of an eye-opening thought from his vantage point, because it's not a kind of research that um, he was necessarily thinking about. Not that he thought, thought that that didn't need to be registered and reported, but it, it's clear that that's a different animal than a standard, um, what, what might be a more standard uh, drug trial. So a lot of these uh, problems from the bulleted list went away. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, by the way, that my community understands that, they're, uh, that, that they've really gone away. But um, the postdoc uh, piece, for instance, um, you, a postdoc, can't run a clinical trial, but you're going to be in somebody's lab, and that somebody, as long as they've uh, got the right qualifications, can be your supervisor for that. It's, it's, it's simply um, not a problem. Uh, they've made it clear that your uh, three-subject pilot data to see if your coils are working in, in your magnet, that's really not what they're talking about in terms of registering um, and reporting. You're not going down the FDA ro uh, route. We're not suddenly subject to FDA regulations. Um, some of the other issues are not um, fully resolved, and that's, you know, that's work for, co for continuing uh, for continuing discussion. Um, and the biggest issue that's not really resolved is what is a clinical trial? Um, uh, it may be that this expansion was designed to, to uh, catch this collection of edge trials or ed edge cases that the NIH was worried about, but of course now there's a new edge somewhere else. Um, and uh, it lies in the midst, among other places, in the midst of the behavioral science um, world. And it's very difficult to figure out what is or is not going to be considered a clinical trial. Um, not that NIH hasn't worked on this. Uh, one of the things that they have done is to create 
a collection of case studies and you know, give you a little brief description and then go through the four questions and, oh, I left off the line at the bottom that says whether it is or is not a clinical trial. You will notice that the case studies currently run from number one to case 42C. Um, it's been, it, it's, it continuously gets expanded and, and revised. And um, it's, a, uh, it, it's a Talmudic exercise to, to actually try to figure out um, if you're on the border, uh, whether, you know, well, well, which case would actually exactly apply to yours. Um, so the, the solution that we're given is talk to your program officer. If you don't uh, get a good answer from your program officer, um, Mike Lauer has said, send me the, um, the, 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 send me the question. And you have this remarkable situation. I can't imagine he wants to do this on, on, on a long-term basis where he ends up as the arbiter of whether um, some odd working memory experiment is or is not going to be uh, deemed a clinical trial. Uh, he's been remarkably responsive to people who have reached out to him about this, but it doesn't seem like a, uh, um, like a long-term like long solution. Um, okay, so that's one path, and I think it's an extremely important path of a continuing dialogue between uh, people in the community and people at NIH who fundamentally have the same goals but need to figure out together how, how to make that work. Um, the other path has been to uh, push back more vigorously against that definition. Um, these are not necessarily mutually exclusive uh, paths, I should say. Um, and and uh, that's, I think, summarized very nicely. Um, uh, James Peckar at, at, at um, Hopkins um, came up with the, the following little story that says, imagine that a government agency had reclass reclassified horses as motor vehicles and then convened a stakeholders meeting. This was uh, brought forth at a stakeholders meeting of NIH and behavioral science. Um, to, to open the meeting, an official says, in order to go forward, we should work on finding consensus regarding three issues, registration, licensing, and insurance. The appropriate response, uh, says Jim, is uh, no, respectfully, the issue is not registration, licensing, and insurance. There's a more fundamental issue, which is that horses are not motor vehicles. Um, and that is, so if you are thinking of clinical trials in the sense in which we have commonly thought of clinical trials, that's a fair point. The sort of do it in a week study of 12 um, undergraduates pulled uh, with informed consent um, from uh, intro psych or something like that is not of the same kind as um, let's see if this, uh, this drug works or let's do um, different plastic surgery on two sides of your face, um, which is, that does seem to require informed consent. I'm, I'm, um, and so the, uh, the, the FABs and the other sort of lobbying uh, organization or advocacy organizations in behavioral science in DC took this um, approach to, um, to Capitol Hill and um, that resulted in language in, um, uh, in one of the omnibus funding bills that, um, that then led to the state that we are in uh, at this point, which is that um, NIH is delaying the enforcement and registration of the registration and reporting policy um, for prospective basic science studies involving human participants um, through September of this year. So we're in a sort of um, a, a, a hold at the moment. The policy is um, in, in place but, uh, but in abeyance. Um, as, Another piece of um, uh, the, the, the language from, from the Hill was to, um, to ask for more 
consultation. Um, and uh, another one of the, the new evolving pieces in this story um, is BESH, uh, Basic Experimental Studies with, uh, with Humans. Um, this is becoming a new category. Um, well, here there are really now three, sort of three categories. There are clinical trials, there are these uh, ba basic human study things, and there's, there's other stuff. Um, at the BESH things also are subject to the clinical trials um, regulation, uh, but they are, at the very least, an acknowledgment that there are a couple of different kinds of things happening here um, in, in, this, uh, in this space. So, uh, so, so where are we at this point? Um, well, here's where I am. Today is March 6th. My uh, latest renewal of uh, an R01 went in um, March 5th, yesterday. Um, and the new piece in, in the forms is this tab for human subjects and, um, and clinical trials. And I very deliberately decided not to try to um, get myself you know, on the non-clinical trial side of the case study definition thing. I decided I'm going to be a clinical trial um, for, this, uh, for this purpose. By the way, um, to t pick up on the previous talk, um, I am now, for the first time, a clinical trial. I am also, I believe, um, exempt. Uh, from, from regulation, uh, uh, except that uh, uh, Dr. O'Rourke, who is my boss in that regard, and in, in, I'm one of her 9,000 um, uh, clients. Um, I'm not sure if I'm one of the five she was worried about. Um, <laughs> but in any, in any case, I am now both exempt and a clinical trial, which is, uh, at the very least, a little head spinning. Um, but yeah, see, look, it says I'm exempt. I clicked that box, and I clicked all the yeses on, on there. I really wanted to see what, uh, what, what the process was like. Um, and, and I was doing this in email contact with, uh, uh, with, with Dr. Lauer at, at NIH. I don't think I have the full, um, uh, oh, no, it doesn't quite give it. So it's, um, Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, so you, you have to do things like give us a summary and give a, a, a narrative description of your, your study. Look at, look at the um, characters remaining possibility. You get like 32,000 characters for this. I'm doing 20 clinical trials. Can you imagine how long my grant proposal could be in principle under these? You know, if I, if I, if I didn't know what, uh, if, if I wasn't talking to Lauer and didn't know what I was doing, he basically said, oh, just give us some you know, short that tells us what, what's going on. And the other rule is take the, the proposals, take the, the experiments that are uh, structurally similar and bundle them together. So I actually wrote up four clinical trials for this grant. Um, it's not trivial bureaucratically. I mean, if you take a look at the public reporting burden, it says that doing this is estimated to take four to 14 hours per response. Um, to be fair, if you're doing it 20 times, the, 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 the time comes down a bit. But it's not trivial, but nor is it as catastrophic as we originally thought it, it would be. Um, my grant proposal, um, if if we were doing, uh, if we were still doing paper copies, um, this would be considered, um, uh, th 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 this wouldn't make it in the Green New Deal, right? I'd be sacrificing whole forests in the Northwest to print out my, my grant proposal. Now it got much, much fatter. But it wasn't, um, it, it, it's, it's not a catastrophic change in the way that you apply. Um, it remains to be seen, since the enforcement really hasn't started, whether there are um, uh, serious pitfalls in the process of um, review and then the process of what you need to do once you have a funded um, clinical trial of this variety. Um, but, okay, so it's not completely smooth sailing, but where, where would we go? Where should we go if we were, if we were really headed for the promised land? 
um, here. Look, I think most people um, agree that some variety of registering and reporting would really be good for everybody, clearly required for the, the, the sort of colloquial clinical trial, makes perfectly good sense for these BESH um, sorts of uh, studies that people like, uh, people like me do. And look, frankly, if you're taking money from, uh, from the taxpayers to, to study um, rats, mice, monkeys, whatever, it's not clear why you shouldn't be subject to some variety of registering and reporting requirement as well. Um, this is an obvious uh, approach to things like the, the file drawer problem. Right? We all know, probably, of experiments that we did that didn't work. You can't publish it in a regular journal because regular journals are not, um, well, there are some now out there, but they're mostly not the journal of stuff that didn't work at all. Um, the problem is it would be really useful to know when I have a, a, a new idea. It would be great if a database, and it can be called clinicaltrials.gov if it likes to be, I'd love to be able to type in a few key words and discover that six other people have tried this brilliant idea and it's a dud. That would save me, um, that would save me a lot of time. Um, so this, basically this move towards more open science is, is, is clearly a good thing. What we need and what uh, certainly if you go off into the animal research realm we need um, are portals that make sense. Right, the portal that makes sense for a classical clinical trial is simply not well designed for um, exploratory research in, uh, in the behavioral sciences. Um, and there are evolving uh, portals that make more sense. Uh, open science framework is, is, would be one of a number of examples. Um, and uh, NIH is actively talking with the folks at Open Science about how can we um, have a portal that works on your end that would then populate something like grants.gov in a way that works on the, uh, on the NIH side. Um, this, was, this was the end of my, my story uh, un uh, until my three hour delay at Logan um, uh, uh, yes yesterday, day before yesterday. Um, where I got email telling me about another round of this. There's a, a, a letter that went to um, um, Dr. Collins from a, a set of people, uh, uh, well, current and former members of uh, national advisory councils from several of the institutes um, that was basically saying, basically part of this pushback against the, 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 the calling these uh, our kind of research um, clinical trials. And there has been another round of question and answer um, from the House uh, subcommittee, um, relevant House subcommittee to NIH with responses back from NIH, um, uh, and, and then a, a series of emails uh, you know, within, the, within the behavioral science community responding to this. Um, I, that conversation has looked uh, a, a little more like the original conversation, where people are, are, are talking past each other more than, I was a little disappointed in, 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 in seeing this, because it really looked like um, a little um, back to where we were a, a, a year ago or so. But I think we can think of it as a spiral. Things are getting, we're, we're, we're getting closer to a, uh, a, a place that we can all live with, I think. But there's a certain amount of, uh, of tension back and forth still as we, as we get there. Um, I think what we can conclude is, um, I'm not sure Carrie would entirely agree, but I, I think that um, this is a job that needed do doing, the registering and reporting and open science and cure the file drawer and, and, and meet your obligations to the taxpayers. That's a job that's absolutely worth doing and important. Um, the particular details of the tool that was used, I would say, um, were not ideal. Um, and we have a choice at this point about uh, resolving this in an essentially adversarial kind of way or 
in a collaborative way. I think the collaborative way is obviously, you can probably guess, I think is more likely to be useful for the field um, as a whole and will still meet, uh, still meet NIH's goals. And I think I will stop there. And since you weren't waving things at me, we must have good time. Okay. All right. Do I should I, should I sit all the way over by my name? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be. Oh, they've taken the names down. Good. You're golden. Okay. So we have a really nice amount of time for questions and answers. Hello. We have a nice amount of time for questions and answers. As you know, there are the two standing mics. Love you to go there. If you can't make it to a standing mic, raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. I'd love it if you'd introduce yourself a little bit and then uh, provide your question. And I'll try to repeat the questions. I understand we've had a little trouble with some of the folks hearing, not here in the room, but uh, those who are listening in. So, I'm Susan, back. you're hmm. back. So I wonder, Jeremy, if you could kind of uh, switch gears and illuminate the problem from the standpoint of research participants themselves. Mm. So from the standpoint of research participants, what's at stake in this bifurcation? You know, your research is a clinical trial. Your research isn't a clinical trial. Besh, does it matter to research participants themselves which it is? So. Um, oh, I, I, I should say that one of my important disclosures should have been that I am not related to Susan Wolf. Oh, yes, there is. That's true. Who, who does not spell the name correctly. I was going to say who the, does not spell the name correctly. But. <laughs> um, so, I, I, so I think there are really sort of two pieces of that answer. I think from the vantage point of most um, of the participants in the standard behavioral science uh, sort of basic behavioral science uh, um, study, um, it doesn't matter and probably wouldn't come up, right? It, uh, if there's a consent form, um, unless Dr. O'Rourke tells me otherwise, um, it's unlikely to say um, we are enrolling you in a clinical trial versus we are enrolling you in a basic human experimental study or something like that. It's going to say, you know, do you consent to being bored out of your mind in exchange for minimal extra credit in your intro psych class? Or that's the way we usually phrase these things. Um, <laughs> the, um, the place where uh, the, the, there is a potential effect that we have worried about um, for the participant or the public more generally is does this confuse um, the public's use of clinicaltrials.gov. Um, this can probably be taken care of by putting the right filters into the database, but you can imagine the problem. Um, everybody and their grandmother in cognitive science is uh, studying uh, folks on the autism spectrum somewhere. Okay, you have a uh, a child who has been uh, given a diagnosis as being somewhere on the spectrum, you think, oh my goodness, what can I do? I'm going on to clinicaltrials.gov to see if there's anything I can do. And you get a whole bunch of weird studies of, uh, of uh, I did a study on, on uh, visual search in, uh, with, with uh, high functioning autistic observers. Um, and that is a very different kind of thing than a, we have an intervention thought of in the more clinical uh, colloquial sense of there. We have an intervention that might help your kid. And um, nobody wants that confusion in there. The question is, how do you avoid that confusion? One way would be to not call everything I do a clinical trial. Um, the other is, okay, if you've decided you're going to call everything I do a clinical trial, figure out a way that, that, that uh, when mom and dad go on to clinicaltrials.gov, uh, they get meaningful results out of the database. So is somebody working on that issue? Carrie, did, did, is, I, did, is it a major breach of protocol if we just ask Carrie to come up here and join this party? I mean, she really does know a great deal is more that, about all this. Is that what we're doing next? Right? Do you want, so, yeah, 
come on up. <laughs> they, uh, I did, I did, I did. yeah, my, my thunder is a little limited on that side, so steal away. Um, uh, yes, someone is working on that. Um, uh, so uh, clinicaltrials.gov, one of the important things to understand, and, and in some ways this helps you understand the semantic issue related to clinical trials. If I could go back in time, um, I, I would, the, the one thing I would really change is calling, is the term clinical trial, right? Because a lot of this, I think, is this reaction to um, what, what we're calling a clinical trial. Um, when we are, really, we're talking at the end of the day about taxpayer studies involving human beings. Um, that doesn't roll as trippingly off the tongue. Is that a good um, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but a lot of this is because, it, you know, all roads lead to this, this database called clinicaltrials.gov. NIH runs that database. We didn't come up with the name. It's in law. Um, uh, this is, again, where, where, where law isn't always the best, uh, the best instrument. Um, and so um, I, I think it should be noted that, in fact, behavioral and basic science studies have been registered in clinicaltrials.gov for a long time um, before it was, there was sort of a re requirement or expectation to do so. Um, behavioral and basic scientists on their own registered things in, in clinicaltrials.gov. And so there are filters built into the system that allow you to do that. Um, uh, I'm not going to pretend to say that they're perfect. I think we have been under sort of a continuous state of um, steady improvement for clinicaltrials.gov uh, uh, for a long time now, and I think that's going to continue to evolve, recognizing the fact that it is a database with many audiences, right? So there, it's a database for researchers like Jeremy who want to know if other people are already doing um, that study. It's for um, uh, people who are studying studies, so what, what are uh, researchers doing, um, uh, what are the trends, and it is, um, in the case of FDA, it's a compliance tool um, uh, for FDA uh, uh, relevant trials, and it is also a place where participants or people who have been struck with illness or a particular condition are searching for information. Um, and so um, uh, trying to come up with a site, a portal that meets the needs of all of those different audiences is a challenge, but it is a challenge we are sort of continually un undertaking, and it is getting better um, over time, and I hope to see it continue to get better. And, and, it, and, and it would be exciting, actually, for our community um, if the conversation ended up turning from what a nuisance it's going to be to get your stuff into clinicaltrials.gov to, gee, how useful it is to have all that information there. Um, a, a possibly similar example might be um, PubMed, right? I don't do, strictly speaking, medical research, but under uh, uh, somebody's mandate, all my stuff has ended up in PubMed for years at this point, and that's really useful. Um, it's a useful database. You know, you, you, you Google a topic these days, and, and the top hit is likely to be some papers from, um, from the PubMed site. And so, so there, there, there's, there are possible benefits for us as well as, um, as, well as the pitfalls. I'm going to take my opportunity and ask a question. Are you seeing, are you, or are you, well, and I am, <laughs> I'm seeing people change the nature of their research to avoid having to suddenly fill out reams of additional stuff uh, because they'd be clinical trials. And I'll give you an example. Correlational research, um, examining, you know, studying kids over time, trying to understand the development of internalizing and externalizing problems. Researcher wants to do a study, include the true social stress test finds out from NIH that that would turn it into a clinical trial because you're doing something to change a physiological parameter. Ergo, it's a clinical trial. This is a person who registers their studies. <laughs> so, but he just did not want to have to deal with all the additional stuff, so there goes what would be a good measure to use to avoid not, I mean, part of the problem is, right, the clinical trial, um, the study, whatever those are called, study reports, Ask all sorts of questions that makes no sense if you're not trying to cure something. 
Right? What's the purpose of your study? Uh, to study normal development. Um, so I'm seeing people change the research to avoid that because, not because they don't want to register or report, but because the reporting process right now and the, what, the forms you have to fill out is just doesn't fit the kind of research we do. So you've filled so, out the form. Yeah, are you carrying I, some I, of this? I haven't thought about that, but I'd be curious about your... Uh... Um, so I, I, I found uh, for my own, well, let, 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 let me say that um, I do not know stories at this point of people who changed their research itself um, in, the, in, in, my, in my circle. Or changed the measures they were taking. To no, 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 no. Right. I, I, don't, I don't have an, an, an analogous story. In, in the, the stories that I have been hearing are stories about, in effect, changing the description of your research in nice. such a way as to get your program officer right. to send you an email that says you're not a, a, a clinical trial. And my favorite version of this is um, a colleague of mine who had a study, had, had a grant ready to roll, um, uh, sent that note to his program officer. The program officer gave him the wrong answer that, uh, from his vantage point. You are a clinical trial, so oh God, going to fill out all these things. At the same time, he sent a, a, a note up to um, uh, Dr. Lauer. So he spends a week filling out all the forms, and then Lauer sends him a note back saying, ah, it's not a clinical trial. Um, so, but the, 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 this, this, the, the cases that I know about are on the border, not, not you edit your science to fit the model, but you just don't quite know where it, it, it lies. Um, I should say that in, in my own experience in the last few weeks doing this, um, it was burdensome, but not crushingly so, compared to, compared to the stories you know, compared to our original fears about it, it's not that bad. Um, it's on a par with all the other exciting things you do, like keeping Dr. O'Rourke happy. Yeah. Um, you know, I think um, I want to take a little step backward because we've been very focused on registration and reporting. Mm. Um, but, but truthfully, the entire effort around clinical trials stewardship reform at NIH was about more than that. Um, it was really, we, we took a look um, for a variety of reasons, um, and for the interest of time I won't go into those, into all of the studies that we were funding involving human beings, so again, taxpayer dollars and human beings, and discovered a lot of problems, not just, I mean, certainly within the traditional sort of definition of clinical trial space, but we found we were funding a lot of studies that were not very rigorous, frankly, that, that didn't meet the definition of rigor. Um, they, um, uh, from a scientific design point of view, and I will say this isn't limited to human studies, as Jeremy alluded to. I mean, this is something we're interested in sort of across the board. Humans tended to take first priority because um, uh, people care a lot about humans. Um, we have a higher ethical responsibility to humans than we might to other, um, although in my world we have ethical responsibilities to say the animals um, uh, we use in, in, in studies as well. And there were other issues in kind of the human study space that um, uh, made us tackle this first. But a lot of the new, the um, the uh, issues on the FOA, the funding opportunity announcements, the additional information we're asking you for, the additional things that you put in your form, um, they're there for a reason because we want to make sure that you are in fact thinking ahead of time about your study design and that you are designing rigorous studies and that we have the ability, the information we need to assess that um, uh, before giving you taxpayer dollars to do your study. In an ideal world, if everybody was Jeremy, who is quite thoughtful and, and, and thinks about, you know, and his studies, um, I, you know, we wouldn't put in place policies to sort of force human behavior, um, but, you know, a lot of our time actually is spent dealing with kind of what you heard from Pearl is the investigators who aren't left to their own devices um, sort of doing the right thing 
thing in terms of the science, in terms of ethics, whatever it is. And yeah, that's a lowest common denominator approach in some ways. Um, uh, but it is also this expectation that, you know, scientific freedom is not the same thing as freedom. Um, uh, and so, you know, if you are taking money from the taxpayers, there's a certain obligation that goes with that. And yeah, a certain burden that goes, that, that goes with that. Um, uh, how many folks are coming from sort of the ethics space in the point of view in here? How do you feel about the idea that um, people are tying themselves in knots to get around rules? Um, I, I, you know, like, let's just take a gut check on that because I think it is a, 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 an important thing. Now, I, I do think that in that space there is a common sense, well, if the rule is stupid, right? Like, you know, um, uh, but, but some of this too, I think, you know, whenever we do a policy change um, uh, from just sort of a philosophical view, we get a pushback because change is hard, right? And, and so that's gonna be true no matter what, even it's the, the most you know, um, common sense policy in the world. And there are, um, the pushback I think comes in several flavors. There's the kind of pushback that, that Jeremy described in the ongoing dialogue between NIH where it's like, hey, you didn't think through some of the impact in the real world. Let's, let's think about that and let's solve those problems. That's a very reasonable approach. There is the um, pushback that is almost a, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a philosophical objection of like, hey, I, you know, I don't like that this is called a clinical trial. It's not what I'm, uh, you know, objecting to what you do here, but I, I don't like the semantic. And then there is also sometimes just resistance to change. And so some of the comments that we've gotten are things like, well, who do you think you are to tell me how I should do my research? And I find myself thinking, well, I'm the NIH. You know, I, <laughs> you want my money. Um, uh, you know, like we, we, we do have these, these certain, and it's important to tease those out because sometimes they're lumped together in one big package of like, uh, you know, like, we hate this, do something. And so, I, you know, my job is kind of teasing out what are the reasonable comments from the, like, I've just been doing it this way for a long time, and now you're telling me I have to do something different, and I don't like that. Um, because I, I think that may or may not be based in, in reasonableness. Got it. Yeah. We have three questions, and we have four minutes. So I'm going to start here because you were the first one up. Hi, I'm Harvey Arbit. I am a uh, regulatory affairs consultant. I specialize in investigator-initiated trials. And I'm listening to this, and it brings back something that happened in 2001. Do you recall Dr. Tob Togayas at Johns Hopkins University? He was doing a study, and you talk about whether it's a pilot study, whether it's clinical trials, how do you define that? Maybe a rose by any other name smells as sweet. I don't know. But he administered hexamethonian to a normal subject, one of his lab people. She died. Okay? The FDA got involved and said to Dr. Kovayas in his, uh, regular, his warning letter, you should have known better. You've done trials like this before. You should have filed an IND. The IRB didn't do its job properly, didn't look at the informed consent form very well. Nowhere in the form consent form did it say hexamethonium is not an approved drug. And the bottom line to this was Johns Hopkins was shut down for a period of time until they could get their act together. So I, I, my recommendation is if you're going to administer something, especially a drug, to a human subject, you need to determine, is this something that FDA should be looking over? Had, they, had he done that, maybe the FDA would have looked at the protocol and said, you need to do something different here so that you don't put the subjects at risk. Oh, I, I, I certainly yeah. wouldn't have any dis with disagreement with that. I think that the, um, uh, and, and presumably there would be some regulation that even if you're just trying it out for the fun of it on one subject, there are things that you obviously can't do. The examples that I'm thinking of are, well, they are pretty well captured in the notion of being both exempt and a clinical trial, where what you're doing to the, um, to the uh, participant um, is minimal risk at best. 
but it, it, it seems it seems self-evident that if you're doing things that have uh, a, a significant risk, that uh, calling it a pilot study does not get you off the hook. Yeah, woman over here. Hi, um, fascinating conference thus far. I appreciate everyone's talks. Uh, when it comes to behavioral studies, what it sounds like to me is changing everything to a clinical trial is taking away that preclinical trial space where you can do the basic science. That's, that's what I'm hearing in this argument is that you're losing that space to be able to do maybe some of your more basic stuff on when it comes to humans, but maybe I'm uninformed and uneducated. I'm just a PhD student here in biomedical <laughs> engineering, so I have minimal info on all this stuff. Yeah, it, it's, it's not taking away that, um, that space, um, but it is, um, it, it's redefining work that you're doing in that space uh, in a way that uh, leads to questions like that and, 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 and uh, has, has been um, confusing. That, uh, uh, that exploratory research, um, it, makes it makes sense to have some variety of you're taking our money, this is what you need to do. Um, but the, 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 the standard mechanisms around clinical trials are not well suited to that type of research. One last question, quick. Okay, I'll be really fast. So my question is about the coordination with NSF. So I'm a computer scientist, and we ask people to put on a head-mounted display and tell us about what they're seeing. I don't think of that as a clinical trial, you know, and I mean, you talk about people being in blissful ignorance. This is completely not on our radar, because we don't get funded from NIH. But so I put people in a head-mounted display, I ask them about what they see, and then maybe they get cyber sick. And so then we look at what we can do to change the visual so that they don't get sick. I mean, now, like, is, and if that is not considered a clinical trial and people who do research like me are not subject to any of the things that people who do research like you guys do, I think that's a problem because you've got, you know, all of us over here within NSF land and, you know, we just, like, yeah, um, so anyway, if you could talk about... Yeah, that, that, that's to Pearl's point about, uh, you know, when regulations apply differently depending on who's funding you or whether you're funded. Um, the, the, what you're describing, uh, when you do get NIH money, I, in, in, in my read of this, would almost undoubtedly be a clinical trial. Okay. Thank you, guys, very, very much. We now have a 15-minute break. Uh, you need to go and get your lunches, which are out there. Get them, come back, thank you. right, thank you. and settle down, because then we're moving on. Thank you. Thank our speakers, too.